these groups stop their normal clawing, scratching, complaining, and demanding. Also, those early New Deal policies did not end the depression and unemployment. So more new programs are rolled out, increasing still more government's intervention in the economy, still more programs to help those in need. Policies started then, we still live with today. By 1934, America's political climate had become explosive. The New Deal had shown people what government could do, and now they wanted more. The demagogues began to appear. Father Coughlin, the radio priest, had 40 million listeners. I ask you if you will rise in your places and pledge with me to restore America to the Americans. Dr. Francis Townsend led a national movement demanding old age pensions that were disastrously expensive in 1934 dollars. Provides that all citizens 60 years or of age or over who wish to do so may retire on a pension of $200 per month. Senator Huey Long of Louisiana, the kingfish, proposed to soak the rich and share the wealth with the poor. 85 to 80 to 85 percent of the people not only give up their property year after year, but they go further and further and further into economic slavery. Roosevelt knew he had to head off the extremists, and he did. I am pushing up-to-date government in place of anti -clean. America calls for a government with a soul. He sent Congress a bushel of new bills, the Second New Deal, more radical than the first. The highlight of the Second New Deal was a program that changed the landscape of American life. The Social Security Act, still at the heart of government assistance half a century later. The civilization of the past hundred years with its startling industrial changes, has tended more and more to make life insecure. This social security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefits the Social Security Act provided old age insurance, unemployment insurance, and help for the disabled and for dependent children. And the prevention of ill health. Social Security wasn't charity. You paid into it, and so did your boss. And then you collected when you retired or if you were unemployed. It was protection, like insurance, except that the insurance company was the government. It seems to me that if the Senate and the House of Representatives in this long and arduous session had done nothing more than pass this security bill, Social Security Act, the session would be regarded as historic for all time. The Social Security Act has, has transformed our lives. Uh, before that, I don't think we have any notion how, um, how risky life was. There was no retirement. There were no private retirement programs. There were no programs for people who were disabled or blind or mothers who were widowed with children or persons who were simply sick. And you, you died. Uh, you died early. Or you lived miserably and you lived in fear. Other industrialized nations had similar laws. But for the United States then, Social Security was a radical step. The naysayers said it would make Americans shiftless, that it would bankrupt the country. This is the largest tax bill in history. And to call it Social Security is a fraud on the working man. The president seems entirely willing to mortgage the complete future of the American people, but suggests absolutely no method for paying off the mortgage. It looks to many of us as if we're headed straight toward national disaster. Of course, that's what a lot of people are saying today about Social Security, now that there are more old people who need it and fewer young people to pay for it. 
But in 1935, there were other things to worry about. People needed work. The job programs of the first hundred days had ended. The PWA was still building its great projects, but not enough to employ the millions with no jobs. For them, Roosevelt created the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, the biggest and most expensive job program of them all. Suddenly, there were three and a half million tunnel builders and street sweepers, and you name it, they did it for two dollars a day. Sleep while you work, while you rest, while you play. Lean on your shovel, pass time away. Take what you do, you can die for your pain. There were even artists, painters, sculptors, writers, actors on the government payroll. The critics invented a new word for the WPA, boondoggle. It was a haven, they said, for loafers and bums and leaf rakers. Yeah, there were leaves raked. True. And by the way, there were, I'm sure there were loafers. But the percentage of you was so small, it's hardly worth discussing. There was never talk about what people saw for a pittance. A play that they never could have seen in their lives before. A painting they never would have seen before. This is also part of their lives. Man does not live by bread alone. There was an old slogan years ago, bread and roses too. WPA provided bread and roses too. For the first time in American history, government was helping the arts and the artists. The WPA hired painters like Jackson Pollock, writers like John Steinbeck, actors like John Houseman. The arts projects were just one small part of the WPA, but they became a symbol of the humanity of the New Deal. I think they did give a great many people a sense of dignity, a sense of identity in society.